far away from the desolation of Huxley. Many miles as the crow flies, across sweeping plains and rolling valleys, over the jagged peaks of mountain ridges and harsh rocky wastelands lay the sea. On a cold evening, as grim winter prepared to give way to sweet spring, the sun dipped below the horizon. It painted the ocean's bubbling grey surface a vivid molten gold, tinged with ruby red. A man stood, with his keen eyes fixed on six strangers, brutish-looking men, relaxing around a roaring campfire, ready for their evening meal. The man inhaled. The crisp sea breeze carried the mouth-watering scent of roasting fish. It was a tempting smell, though it lacked the aromatic punch that fresh dill or chives would have provided, which didn't surprise the man. Very few people shared his enthusiasm for the details. The strangers had the numbers advantage. They looked strong and well-fed, but the man was far from harmless. A viciously playful smile crept onto his thin face. After months of travel, isolation and boredom, the fun could truly begin again. After hitching his horse to a nearby tree, the man set off towards the strangers, radiating confidence. Clearly, he was a man with a plan, and although he was walking into what was undoubtedly a dangerous situation, his purposeful steps never faltered. Considering you sat on your fat ass doing nout today, you seem more than happy to stuff your face, said one man with a sneer, before spearing his own piece of fish to pull from the fire. What are you talking about doing nout? I were keeping watch. And making the fire what's cooking your food, you ungrateful prick, replied a second man, tensing his heavily bearded jaw. If looks could kill, the first man would have dropped dead on the spot. Yeah, right, the fire what you got to sit by all day, keeping cosy and warm while the rest of us were down there freezing our bollocks off. But you're too good for that, ain't you, Hob? You lazy worm. The first man spat back with a frustrated gesture, down to the rocky beach, currently being battered by the ocean waves. Jod even says he saw you sleeping at one point. I never was! Hob roared, sending partly chewed fish debris flying from his mouth as he leapt to his feet, rounding on a bald-headed third man. What are you saying that for? Should knock you out or should tell in lies like that? Just saying what I saw, replied Jud, making an attempt to sound bored and scraping food from between his teeth but he couldn't hide the smirk of satisfaction at the drama unfolding before him. Hob took an angry step forward, but then stopped in his tracks as the largest of the six men raised his hand in a warning gesture. It was clear the disagreement was now over, and although tension still crackled through the air between the men, Hob repositioned himself in front of the fire, and nothing more was said for a moment. Everyone was focused on their food, and so nobody noticed the newcomer stride right up and help himself to a large chunk of fish. In fact, it was only as he reached for his second piece that Hob looked up and registered what was happening. Even then, he was confused and unsure of what he was seeing. In stark contrast with the six members of Hob's gang, the newcomer was immaculately dressed. With a green travelling cloak fastened around his shoulders, grey cotton shirt and brown woolen trousers. The thing that truly caught Hob's eye was the expensive looking pair of riding boots. They were polished to perfection and the dark leather shone almost as brightly as the silver buckles adorning them. He could make a pretty penny out of those boots at the right market. Raising his head once again, Hob looked the stranger in the eye, not liking what he saw there, but before he could say a word, the man beat him to it. Hello, gentlemen, he said calmly, and suddenly the camp was a blur of movement. Five men leapt to their feet, snarls on their faces, hands darting to their knives. The only one that remained where he sat was Hob, who, for some reason, was strangely calm. The man sighed, holding out his hands to show empty palms. Now, is that any way to welcome a guest? He said with a wry smile. I'm unarmed, my friends. I've been travelling for many miles, and I have an offer for you. So as much as I like a good fight, perhaps we could talk before we descend into violence. Nobody was sure what to say. They simply remained standing, awaiting orders. 
With an angry shake of his shaven head, their leader took a menacing step towards the unwelcome intruder, towering above him. What kind of offer could you possibly make us, and who do you think you are, marching over and helping yourself to our food? Just asking to get killed, that is, he snarled through gritted teeth. I'll answer your second question first, the stranger replied evenly, as he reached for a third piece of fish. My name is Valdus Doyle, and the reason I made myself at home is due to the offer I'm about to make. Reaching into his cloak, Doyle withdrew a large pouch and rattled it in the air before him. It's actually more of an opportunity that I imagine you will find quite fun. I have a job that needs doing, for which I require a few well-trained fighters, and you and your men seem to be a good fit, so here I am. You will, of course, be well compensated. With a signal for the others to remain where they were, the shaven-headed man lowered himself to sit across from Doyle with a nasty grin on his face. Tell me, he said, leaning forwards, so that his face was just inches from Doyle's. What's to stop us from killing you now and taking that big bag of coins, without doing your dirty work for you? At that moment, a shadow fell over the camp. The calm that had been blanketing Hob fell away, and it was replaced with a stomach-churning dread. Before his eyes, the stranger transformed, his handsome face becoming grotesque. Smooth tanned skin turned deathly pale, riddled with countless scars, as though he'd once been savaged by a wild animal. One, larger than the rest, traced the curve of his throat. Warm eyes became sunken and hollow. A leering smile spread across his face. The image only lasted a few seconds before returning to normal, but Hob was filled with a deep, primal terror, the likes of which he'd never felt before. Doyle calmly placed the money bag on the ground in front of him before gesturing to it. Why don't you try? He growled, and Hob shuddered. He knew that the gang's leader, Rand, could never resist a challenge. Don't, he croaked. But the warning was barely audible and already far too late. Rand reached for the pouch with a derisive laugh and Doyle struck faster than Hob had ever seen anybody move. Blood spurted as Rand's hand was separated from the rest of his arm and Doyle kicked it casually into the fire. There was just enough time for Rand to release a guttural scream before Doyle was upon him and the concealed knife that nobody had noticed was buried first into his stomach then his chest, and finally, a slicing motion opened his throat. You're all welcome to try taking the money too, Veldus told them, in a voice so warm they could have been old friends. Of course, it might be easier to simply do this one job for me and get paid instead. The choice is yours. Bear in mind your shares just increased, thanks to your friend's stupidity. Nobody said a word. Valdus shrugged, looking at each of them in turn, waiting for somebody to make a move. But Hob couldn't take his eyes off Rand as he lay there, his blood soaking into the earth beside the fire. It wasn't that he was fond of the shaven-headed thug that had ruled their gang with an iron fist, but the brutality and the ease with which he'd been dispatched was disturbing. Hob had seen Rand take down men, women, children and beasts without remorse. Quite the opposite. Most of the time it had been for sport. Warriors and peasants, the innocent and the defenceless, Rand had never cared. Fighting had never been a problem, and not once had any member of the gang ever seen him struggle to defeat even the most battle-hardened of opponents. It was shocking to think that death could come so easily to such a man. And yet, there stood Doyle. Posture relaxed, seemingly unmoved. Hob couldn't contain the fear that was pulsing through his veins. What's the job? He asked, his voice quivering despite his best attempts to keep it steady. Why don't we all sit down and I'll tell you all about it? 
said Valdus, before taking a seat and gesturing for the rest of them to follow suit. At first, nobody moved, but one by one they took their places around the fire. Two days later, the six men lay on their stomachs watching as people went about their business in a small cove. A collection of around 30 houses stood just outside the reach of the ocean tide, within the shadow of the cliffs that Valdus and his men now used as their vantage point. The plan had been explained, discussed, and set in stone during the two days' ride from the camp at which he'd recruited them. As soon as night fell, and afforded them the cover of darkness, the five men would enter the cove, and death would be their companion. It was a good plan, and it would work. Valdus knew this because it had worked so many times before. At this point, it was easy. Valdus watched as below nets were hauled in along with the day's catch. Children darted to and fro between the houses with cries of excited laughter, dodging and diving to avoid one another, or were caught and tackled to the ground. An innocent game of cat and mouse that their parents watched with loving smiles on their faces. Occasionally, one of them would call out to slow down or dash over to check a skinned knee before returning to their duties. This was a safe place. Or so they thought. Almost a week earlier, Valdus had been on this very spot, patiently observing the settlement to learn their routines. The cliffs prevented entry from the north and west. There were four guards in total, two posted on both the south and east. As soon as the sun set, the strongest members of the settlement, tired and hungry, would make their way to the long, communal building that ran along the base of the cliff, upon which Valdus and his men were now perched like birds of prey, and that would be when they would strike. The sky gradually darkened, and Valdus burned with anticipation. The winter had been so very boring, but now he finally felt like himself, and it was time for the games to begin. Time to go, he told the others as he climbed to his feet. You know what to do. Without a word of protest, the men set off quickly and quietly. Valdus smiled to himself. Above all else, money and fear really were the best motivators. Find a few greedy, cowardly men to bend to your will, and there was nothing that couldn't be achieved by a cunning mind. Before long, he followed upon his horse, and the five men were barely visible, creeping along in the darkness. Good. If he couldn't see them, then neither could the guards. It was a moonless night, with heavy clouds that held the threat of rain, and as the rhythmic crashing of the waves grew louder, Valdus hung back, knowing that it would soon begin. Within a few short minutes, the first exquisite scream pierced the peaceful night. To Valdus, violence was like a fine wine, something to be savoured and appreciated, drawn out and made to last. Tonight would be a particularly splendid vintage. As he waited, he closed his eyes, cherishing the moment. The night was filled with screams of terror and pain. The sound of mounting panic was music to his ears. A symphony of screams, and he was its conductor. Once he was sure the piece was reaching its crescendo, he spurred his horse onwards. It was time to act. In the cove, Hob stood rooted to the spot, feeling sick, horrified and disgusted at the chaos unfolding before him. In truth, he'd never fit in with this gang. But long ago, Rand had given him the choice to join them or die, and that really hadn't been much of a choice at all. Now, he was in over his head, and he hadn't the heart for this. 
The people who lived here were clearly not used to raids and hadn't spared their best fighters. The guards had turned out to be nothing more than children, dressed in their parents' clothes, pretending to be adults. They died without a fight. Once the coast was clear, the other four had stormed into the cove, driven by a lust for blood and money. While Drost barricaded the door to the communal building, Burn, Judd and Grund had set about pulling people from their homes, throwing them down and butchering them where they lay. It wasn't long before the bodies were numerous and the ground was soaked with blood. All around him, Hob could hear nothing but people screaming, crying and begging for mercy. It was all too much. He desperately wanted to help, but he knew he was no match for the others. As three women drew their knives and threw themselves at Grund, Hob turned to run. But he was met with the thundering sound of oncoming hooves, and the last thing he saw was a blade arcing through the air towards him. Valdus felt a smug sense of satisfaction as he beheaded Hob and kept on riding deeper into the cove. That snivelling coward was never going to see this through, and Valdus had known all along that he would be the first to die. Quickly, before any of the others could give the game away, he leapt from his horse and notched an arrow in his bow. It found its mark, whistling through the air and burying itself in Drust's left eye. As he screamed in agony, a second embedded itself in his chest and he collapsed. Valdus watched for a moment to make sure that he wasn't moving before returning his attention to the matter at hand. Byrne, who was standing ten feet away, had noticed what was happening and needed to be silenced. Without hesitation, Valdus fired an arrow into his throat and that was that. Three down, two to go. Gund was next. Two women lay dead at his feet and he prowled towards a third with an evil laugh as she frantically pleaded with him. Valdus came up swiftly from behind and thrust his sword between Gund's shoulder blades, feeling the warm gush of blood over his hand and barely containing the devilish grin that was simply begging to be set free. Did he hurt you? he asked the woman and when she shook her head weakly in response, he left her where she was. There was only one man left, but where was he? Scanning the area, he saw the bald-headed savage kicking at a door, trying to gain entry to a house from which came the frightened wailing of a child. Charging over, Valdus threw Judd to the ground and fell upon him, unleashing a barrage of blows. What kind of soulless beast attacks in the night? He roared, bringing his fist down repeatedly to meet Judd's face, not stopping until the man was no longer moving and his fist was bloody and painful. Somebody had released the people trapped within the communal building. The door burst open and a man flung himself at Valdus, driving the wind out of him, wielding a knife in his right hand. No! screamed the woman, that Valdus had saved moments before as she ran over to grab the attacker's arm. This man helped John! Although a look of confusion crossed John's face, he still didn't lower his knife. Explain yourself, stranger, he growled. How did you come to be here? I was tracking the men who attacked you, Valdus replied, drawing in deep, panic-stricken breaths. I live with my family a few days' ride from here. At least, I did before those savages killed my wife and daughter whilst I was hunting. I've been on their trail ever since. I'm so sorry. If I'd been stronger, faster, I could have helped sooner, but I'm tired and I fell behind. When I heard the screaming, I knew something terrible was happening and I got here as fast as I could, but I was already too late. This was truly excellent. It was Valdus' best performance in a long time and he wished there was an audience to offer him a standing ovation. He'd even managed to make himself cry. These people were nothing more than fish, desperate to latch onto the bait that he was dangling. They were like children who still believed in fairy tales. 
thinking a hero had ridden in to save the day. How naive of them. It was almost too easy. The woman's face was filled with pity, and John was extending a hand to help Valdus to his feet. For just a moment, he considered struggling to get up, but no, better to not overdo it. Once he was upright, he locked eyes with John. The man was tall and broad-shouldered. His pale skin was cracked and weather-beaten, and his dark hair hung in loose curls about his face. Valdus had witnessed his strength firsthand, and he exuded authority. No doubt he would be a very useful friend to have. I can only thank the gods for sending you at all. As you've seen, we're ill-prepared for such scum, John said, as he aimed an angry kick at Judd's body. Now go, get yourself checked over. Once we've seen to the wounded and set the dead right, we'll get some food down you. Please, let me help. Valdus said as he took a step forwards, but John placed a heavy, calloused hand on his shoulder. You've been through enough. I won't hear of it, we owe you a great debt tonight and you look tired. Besides, that hand wants looking at. Now rest, and I'll find you later. Over the next few hours, water was boiled, dressings were prepared and the wounded were stitched up. Valdus was shown to the communal building, and it turned out that his hand was broken, but it was no serious matter. It would soon heal, and overall it did make his act all the more convincing. Once the medics were done with him, he made his way over to where a team of cooks were preparing a meal, and insisted upon helping, telling them that he wanted to keep himself busy. The night drew on, and the dark sky was turning navy blue, when a bell rang out, and everybody made their way outside. In his long life, Valdus Doyle had seen many things but what he witnessed next fascinated him. A large fire burned on the edge of the settlement, and at first he thought that it must be some kind of funeral pyre, but it was not. Instead, the five raiders had been placed upon it, and the flames were eating at their flesh. It turned out that the mourners were offering their dead to the sea. They sang their loved ones into the afterlife, asking the gods to give their souls peace and as the tide receded slowly down the rocky shore, they gently placed the bodies one by one into the water, to drift along to where a strong current would carry them away. By the time the sun had fully risen, there was no trace of them left, and the procession made their way back into the cove. As they walked along in silence with their heads bowed, a young girl no older than fourteen fell behind, reaching out a hand to support herself on one of the houses, before slumping miserably into the dirt. Valdus made his way over, to sit beside her quietly for a moment, wrapping an arm gently around her. Leaning into him to rest her head on his shoulder, she wept bitter tears, that soaked the shirt he'd been given to replace his bloody one. Who did they take from you? he asked, as he softly stroked her shoulder-length auburn hair. Mother! She answered through a sob, and Valdus nodded to show that he understood. What about your father? Gone? A long time ago? Valdus nodded again, gazing out over the open ocean as a razor bell swooped through the air, diving to catch a fish. I'm alone too, he told her. My parents died so long ago, I can barely remember them. Those men killed my wife and my daughter. They were my reason to live and I have no idea what I'm going to do. Stay here, she said, looking up at him through swollen red-rimmed eyes. I'd like that, he replied with a small smile. But I think that's John's decision to make. Perhaps if he can find it in his heart to let me stay, we can keep each other company. And then neither of us needs to be alone. He will. You helped, she said, as she wiped the tears from her freckled face. And as the clouds parted, with the morning sun shining down on them both, and the cool sea breeze upon his skin, Valdus knew she was right. He wouldn't be turned away. Not now that John had already said they owed him a great debt. No, this cove would be his new home. 
and the people would welcome him with open arms, as so many had before. Just the way he'd planned it.